Well, hello from the pastor's study. And as you can see, I'm in the home study this time as the church is getting ready for Christmas and events are happening and it's a busy, busy place. I thought today would be a good time and a good opportunity to come to you and, and to open God's word with you from my home study. So welcome each and every one of you. We are in a series that I've titled, Who is this Jesus? And as we have been going through the book of John, literally verse by verse, I have to make confession here. I have to confess that after having finished in John 3 at verse 16, actually we made it all, to, all the way to verse 19 last time, having finished that, I really thought I was going to just jump over the rest of the chapter and get to chapter 4. The Holy Spirit would not let me do that, would not give me a piece about that. So we want to take a look today at the true nature of ministry, at the nature of true ministry. And I think that this passage is phenomenal. <clears throat> and the more I look at it, it's more teaching than preaching this time, though. You, you have to understand and as we look at this, we see that as Jesus presses deeper into his own public ministry, questions begin to arise. Like, what exactly does Jesus do in his ministry? And how does he relate to others that are in ministry around him? And specifically, how does he relate to John the Baptist? Remember, John the Baptist began his public ministry before Jesus and so, of course, as we think about those questions, they continue even to today. Even in our present day context, we continue to talk about and to speak about and to ask about the true nature of just who is this Jesus. Again, as we think about ministry, what is it you and I are supposed to be doing in terms of ministry and, and you know, how much room do we have to be innovative in doing that? Well, ultimately, how do our ministries relate to the actual person of Jesus Christ and what we've been called to do? How are we supposed to understand our failures and our successes in ministry? How do we look at it? How do we take it? What should we think when we see other churches around us that are, are growing and going and being and doing? They're increasing and yet we sometimes are decreasing. Although we haven't been doing that for a while. But Jesus addressed a seeker in Nicodemus in the first half of John 3. But now the narrative is going to switch to John the Baptist. And it's to allow John the Baptist to teach about this nature of ministry and the nature of true ministry. As John the Baptist begins to decrease, those who are close to him, those that are near to him, feel that Jesus has done him a disservice. But John, you know, he has a very different perspective on that. And in this passage, we, we see really one of the clearest descriptions in the entire Bible about the activity and the motivation and the message of true Christian ministry. Understand that ministry that we're talking about here is for each and every one of us, not the ministry of the pastor, but personally, individually, and corporately in the church. This is a message we desperately need to hear as we continue to seek and to see who is this Jesus. Have you ever been to a, a wedding with, with a sand ceremony? Now, a sand ceremony is where the bride and the groom bring containers of sand, different colored sand. One will be red and the other blue. Usually that's the, the sequence, that's the color. And um, they take those two containers and they pour them in to a larger container at the same time and those two colors are being mixed in that larger container. The idea behind it is that you could more easily separate the colors of sand from this one single container 
then you could, in disentangling this marriage, the lives of these two people that are, that are getting married, it'd be a whole lot easier to separate that sand grain by grain than these two lives that are being joined together. But what if the bride said, you know, she's she's going through this and, and, and before she does it, she has the thought that she's going to lose her identity. And she says, Pastor, would it be okay if we, we, we held some back because we're still going to be individuals? Shouldn't we probably keep back a portion? I'm thinking that they probably wouldn't know what they're symbolizing because the fact of the matter is that in a marriage you just can't separate the two parts from each other. I mean, that's the whole point of marriage, right? The two shall become one flesh. You're thoroughly, totally given to one another. In fact, there's a word for trying to hold anything back from the marriage. It's called infidelity. It's not something that you or I would want to be a part of. Well, listen, folks, it's not only true in marriage God gives us marriage as a picture of what is even more true in our relationship with him as the bride of Christ, as the church that he's called us to. Christ doesn't ask us to give pieces of us, you know, just a piece here, a piece there and hold back or whatever. He demands everything from us. He wants our minds, our hearts, our souls, our spirits, our bodies. He wants every bit of us. You see, the call to discipleship, Jesus says, is the call to pick up your cross, to lay down your life and to pick up your cross, to follow wherever he leads. And so as we look at this passage, we're seeing just what that looks like, how it's, it really shows up. And as I said, it was true in Jesus' day, and it's still true today. This whole thing, this, you know, the way it works together tells us that Jesus wants to tell you he, that he wants all of you, all of you. Let's look at how that works. And I want to start, first of all, with an observation. This is the only place in Scripture, in the entire Bible, where we read of Jesus' ministry of, map, of baptism. I'm sorry. In verse 22, let me read the, the passage. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. A lot of people just brush over that. Now, John also was baptizing in Ainan near Salim because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. Verse 25, Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. Verse 27, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase and I must decrease. Just as a small caveat here, if you turn over to chapter 4 and verse 2, we read that Jesus himself wasn't the actual one doing the baptizing. He had commissioned his disciples on his behalf, but Jesus oversaw the ministry of baptism, but it was ascribed to him. <clears throat> now, again, this is the only place in the entire scripture that we see that Jesus was baptizing in his earthly ministry. And that's remarkable because we know that at the end of his earthly ministry, just before he ascends into heaven after his death, burial, and resurrection. 
He's giving his final instructions here on earth, the great commission. He's, he's telling his disciples. And what is it he tells them? He tells them to go for, therefore into all the world. Let me read it. Sorry, I'm trying to, I'm quoting it. I'm, I, I need to stop and read it. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Baptism, folks, is a part of the way that we, as a church, are instructed to make disciples. That, that's part of it. And so we also know that baptism happens at the very beginning of his ministry. And, you know, as I think about that, it's ironic that the Gospel of John actually does not explicitly tell us that Jesus was baptized, although back in verse 23 and 24 in chapter 1, it alludes to that. We recognize it by, by the words that are being used there. We see that if you compare this text in John 1, 23 and 24 with what happens in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that's exactly and explicitly what's, what, what, what's going on is Jesus is being baptized. So we know that Jesus himself was baptized by John the Baptist. But this is the only place in the entire Bible where we read that baptism was part of his earthly ministry. Now, we understand Jesus considered two parts of his ministry. The first was teaching and preaching the word of God. And the second was to um, um, share in the sacraments. <clears throat> sacraments being the Lord's table and baptism. In other words, the ministry of the war word is to inform our minds and the sacraments is to feed and to nourish and to cleanse our bodies. What Jesus says is that you can't give just a sliver of yourself to him. He wants it all. You've got to give him everything. You can't hold anything back. Not, a, not any part of your life can you hold back. That is infidelity. Jesus commands your mind. He commands your body. And where is it going? It's going to the bigger piece that Jesus wants, which is your heart. That's your entirety. That's your soul. That's all of who you are. And that's where it all flows from. So you see, you can have the right theology. You can have the word up here. You can have it all up here and be a hypocrite. And you can do the right things, the actions on the outside, show up at church, take part in the Lord's table, um, get baptized. You can do all of that and still be a hypocrite because what Jesus wants from you is all of you. And when you obey him and what he teaches, it's from your heart. And when you obey him in what he commands, it's from your heart. Jesus wants every bit of us, every bit of us. So we can do these things in ministry to teach and to baptize, whatever. But this is where it gets hard. This is where it gets difficult. It's where we start to get faced with loss. And that loss can come in any number of ways. But that's exactly what's happening with John the Baptist. Remember, John the Baptist has been teaching and preaching. He's been following the Great Commission. This is still the ministry. Even today, the ministry is continuing the same way, all the way from John the Baptist through the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus right up to present day. That's what we're to be doing as a church. We teach and preach God's word and we baptize and make disciples. But here's what happens with John. Now understand, John used to be the big deal. He was the big show. He used to be the destination event in the wilderness which I guess would be a pretty important thing. But what's happening here is that Jesus is now on the scene. Jesus 
has himself undergone baptism by John the Baptist, and now Jesus is starting his earthly ministry of preaching and teaching, performing miraculous signs. He's been talking to people in private conversations like we learned about Nicodemus. And that's what we're going to see in the next chapter, chapter 4, with the woman at the well. He is starting to teach publicly. And the sense that we're getting as we re read those verses I just read is that Jesus has set up a baptism shop just down the river from John the Baptist. Now let me look at verse 25. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. Now, I'm thinking there was probably a question here. A question like, well, which one of these baptisms do I really need? Is it the baptism of John or is it the baptism of Jesus? Which one is going to be the one I need to get me into the kingdom of heaven? And so John's disciples have seen the crowds that have been following them. All of a sudden, they've been diverted to Jesus. And so the disciples of John come to him, frustrated that their influence and their position, their authority is diminished. Look at verse 26. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to you, whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. <clears throat> Pardon me. You see, there's a sense here that they're saying to him, J Dr. John, you know, didn't you know what it was you were doing? You, you gave away all your authority. You gave your power away when you bore witness to Jesus. You see, John, I think that was a foolish mistake. People interpreted that to mean that Jesus was more important than you. John, John, you've been around longer than him. You've been on the scene longer than him. You've got more, more seniority. Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness. Hey, look, he's baptizing now. Uh, John, that's your shtick. And they're all going to him. Listen, if we are giving part of ourselves to Jesus in outward actions, in our theology, in our service, no matter what it is, whatever it is, listen to me very closely, very carefully. There's going to come a time when Jesus is going to begin to squeeze the thing that we really don't want to give over to him. Where Jesus is going to press on that one area in our life just to see where our heart is. John's influence is waning. And the question is, does John want his authority as a power, his populator, uh, po popularity? Uh, or does he want Jesus? Let me, let me pick it up in verse 27. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Can I say these four verses? The, and, and if you can possibly commit them to memory, I, I, I would be so encouraged to see you working on that because these are some of the most important, profound things that we can ever learn about the nature of true Christian ministry. You see, John gives us strategies here that we can use to start to motivate our hearts, to, to start to motivate us into action, to serve, teaching, preaching, baptizing. But now, we test the motivation of the heart. Look at what he says in verse 27. He says, A person cannot receive one thing unless it's given to him from heaven. 
You see, that's the first issue that John the Baptist raises with his disciples. What does it mean to be given from heaven? Can I tell you in three words? God owns it all. Okay, four words. God owns it all. If it's been given from heaven, God owns it all. And it says a man can receive nothing. We're talking about spiritual, emotional, physical. We have nothing that wasn't granted from the God of all there is. My commentary, uh, John Phillips' commentary is right back there on the top shelf. My commentary says that it's really a maxim. It's a general principle, a nugget of wisdom, if you will. He says, look, there is not one thing that any one of us have, not one thing that isn't given to us by grace, and God owns it all. You know, nothing you have in your possession, whether you think it's yours by right or possession, all that you have has been given to you, and it's temporary. It's temporary. You've been given to it, given it as a stewardship. It's been entrusted to you by grace. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. If you'd like to know how to do that, I'd love to spend some time and show you how you can make sure you're faithful in your tithing. But I'll press on. But listen, loss, loss, doesn't matter whether it's physical, spiritual, emotional, whatever it is, financial, <coughs> loss, always hurts it always hurts but loss always hurts a whole lot more when jesus has to pry things loose out of our clenched fingers and john is saying that a man a person can't receive one thing unless it comes from god because god owns it all the the the, the second thing here that we see this practical strategy that John is giving us here is for fighting discontentedness, depression, discontentedness in life, in ministry, in whatever. He flips the script. He flips the script. He says, look, I'm not trying to count up the things that, that may have been taken from me. You know, uh, I, I lost this here and I lost that there. No, no, I'm, you know, not going to worry about losing my influence to Jesus. But instead, he flips the script and he says, look, everything that I have is a gift. And instead of being angry about the things that I'm losing, I need to thank God for what I have. I need to thank God for his provision, for his grace throughout my life, because it all comes from grace. Back in Philippians chapter 4, Paul says, Be anxious for nothing. For nothing. Are you worried? Are you stressed out? Are you concerned and anxious about the things that you might be losing in your life? Well, Paul says, Be anxious of nothing. Huh. Yep, that's easier said than done, right, Paul? He says, You need to take that stuff to prayer. Listen, be anxious of nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. Then he says, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. You know, when we look back at the way God has provided for us and blessed us, met our every need, he's been faithful. He's met each and every single need. Even when we saw no way we can all, I'm sure, testify to that. When we think about that, that totally changes the way we come before our God. We flip the script and we practice thankfulness. And that's the first strategy in fighting this discontentment and discouragement and, and, and depression. Be thankful for what you have. But then look at verse 28. He says, you yourselves bear witness that I said, I'm not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. Again, the motivation of our heart, John says, you yourselves bear witness that I said, I'm not the Christ. 
He's looking back and he's saying, you know, you've been around me. I've never once said that I was the Messiah, that I was the Christ. In fact, I said that I am not the Christ. You know, that was our first introduction in, 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 back in chapter 1 to John, back in, in verse 19. You know, the, the, the delegation of religious leaders were sent out to interview him in the wilderness to, to figure out, you know, who is this guy? Who is this scruffy character, this John the Baptist? Here he is, he's out baptizing and eating locusts and honey and, and dressed in camel skin. And who is he? Well, John says, I'm not the Christ. And that's the first thing he testified to. <coughs> Pardon me. The only antidote, the only antidote to anything that we get faced with is to speak the truth. You, you know, we are confessional. And we're relational. We are confessional, and the Bible calls us to confess to one another, but we are to confess to the Lord, to bring our sins before him, to confess them, to get it right, leave them at the foot of the cross. But we're also relational. He made us relational so that we could relate to each other. Yeah, sure, but to relate to him. I mean, this is why we gather week after week after week. This is why we do what we do. When you go to church, do you sit there passively and watch what's happening from, from a chair down on the floor when, when things are happening even on the platform? No, you don't sit there passively. I mean, I know I'm long-winded, but, but for a lot of 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 the services people ga gather for a lot they're speaking they're they're talking to one another they've been singing they've been reading god's word they've been praying that's participation and that shows up when we confess that i am not the christ but i'm here to worship him i am not the christ but i worship him that shapes us that gives us the foundation to be prepared that when Jesus in his office as Christ, as God, as King of Kings, when he comes and, and takes things from us, we can revert back to that fact that I am not the Christ, but I worship him. I worship him. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. You are the potter, I am the clay. Can we really say that? Let me give you this third strategy for evaluating our hearts. And it comes in verse 29 where, he, where the, 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 John says, He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. What John is saying here is that the ministry that I have is not a game. It's, I don't need to worry about the numbers. If I do what I'm called to do, numbers are going to grow. I just need to continue to do what I've been called to do. And you know, it's easy to start looking around and to see other churches going and growing, to see other people going deeper in their spiritual walk, to see other people growing and, and becoming more successful. But, you know, and especially easy looking at other churches that, you know, are getting bigger and have bigger budgets and all of that kind of thing. But John says, that's not the way you look at it. What you're seeing is, is, you're seeing those other churches as direct competition. That's not the case. We are all the friend of the true bridegroom. Jesus is the bridegroom and the job of the pastor, the job of the elders, the job of the congregation of any church is to come together and care for one another, to love one another, to keep one another pure for Christ. And when we start trying to cling to people and to keep them um, and, and worry about all of that, then, then we're losing it. We're losing it. John says it's like the best man stepping in and, and trying to make an advance on the bride. There are other churches, you know, that, that are out there and are doing well, but there are comrades in arms. They're not our competitors. And then 
in verse 30, he says, He must increase and I must decrease. And I tell you, folks, that is the key to true, true ministry. When we can come, whether it's personally, whether it's a church, and our total desire is to see him high and lifted up, to see him increase in mind, will, emotions, heart, in each one of us, then we see true ministry. John says, he must increase and I must decrease. So can your heart say that? You see, if your life, your ministry has been about what you do for Christ, what you think about Christ, then when Jesus questions your heart and, and begins to squeeze something that's dear to you, someone that's dear to you, that's near to you, it's going to be real difficult. Not that it's not going to be difficult, but when you are walking so close to him that he overshadows every part of your life, that's where the victory is. Now, it's going to be difficult. You're going to have to rethink this. You're going to have to be working on this day by day, through and through. And and the fact is, uh, even someone listening to me right now is going through that kind of a situation, either with person, place, or thing. I don't know. There isn't, there isn't any one of us that don't at some point go through that point of being squeezed. Not one of us. But can I tell you, there's not a quick fix for this kind of thing. You know, you know, we'll, we'll get this fixed and we'll be good for the rest of our lives. No, not at all. Jesus deliberately leads us into these places where he knows we're going to be tested. And he does it to test those things that we're holding on to so tightly. And he does this. Listen, he does it as a gift. Believe it or not, it comes from heaven. Heaven. Because ultimately, if you cling to something other than Jesus, if that's the one thing that you'll, I mean, you'll give up anything and everything, including Jesus, to possess that one thing, that means that you cannot have eternal life. God leads us to give up either some activity that we're involved in or or some of the things that we cling to because he loves us. Now let me read verse 31 to 36. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. Can I tell you the evidence of being in the Son, the evidence of the Son being in us is obedience. It's obedience. You see, this whole narrative has swung from John the Baptist back to John the Evangelist. John the Evangelist is summarizing everything that you and I have gone through at this point in, in, in the study of the book of John. He summarized it. All that Jesus has talked about in his conversation with Nicodemus, all that he wrote in the prologue, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, he's, he's summarized it all. That's the crux of the matter. And John is writing this whole gospel so that we don't miss that. It comes up again and again and again throughout the book. It comes up in several contexts, through several conversations, according to several miracles. 
John wants us to see that unless we are willing to have Jesus and all of him and give him all of us, we do not have eternal life. He's not Lord. You might have head knowledge, but when we have him in our heart and when he has our hearts, then that's when we know we have it. Now, eternal life. You see, John isn't talking about some sort of everlasting existence that we might be in, that we die and wake up suddenly to. Then we we exist through these things that, you know, it's it's almost like life as usual, business as usual forever and ever and ever. That's not what eternal life is all about. It's not what eternal life means. Eternal life isn't perpetual existence after death. Listen, eternal life is a quality of living where we are rightly reconciled to God. We've come to God. We've confessed. We've made him Lord of our lives. We've rightly reconciled and he's Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And eternal life for me began one day on the 26th of September, 1976, when I cried out to God and I said, on my knees, weeping before him because of the sin that I was in. And I said, God, I don't know if you can love me, but if you do, I'll serve you with my life. Well, he does. He did. And I will. I will. You see, that's what it's all about. And when we figure that out, that he must increase and I must decrease, then we have the nature of true worship. Would you pray with me now? And Lord, as we have thought about things that, that are so hard to think about as we think about real pain in our lives. Lord, we ask that you would teach us by your grace to use these things, to see the ways in which you are leading us through all of that, to see the ways in which all is measured. Oh God, that nothing comes to us that doesn't first pass through your hands. We need to see that. We need to understand that. And Father, that you are doing this work in our lives. And what you're doing is to comfort us and to bless us. Lord, nothing that we go through is meant for torment. It's meant to draw us to you. And Father, we know that, that, that all of this is sealed in the blood of your own Son. That Jesus Christ himself suffered and bled and died for each one of us. And Father, we pray that you would give us the mind of Christ to seek that joy beyond the suffering, beyond the, the, the temporal, that we might see it in eternity, in eternal life. And, and Father, we can have that if we have that reconciled relationship with you. And so, Father, draw us to yourself. Help us to understand that we are lost without you. Totally, completely, totally lost. So fill our hearts, fill our lives, Lord, to overflowing with your grace and your abundant mercy. And we'll give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.